in August of this year over in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is where my family lives, uh, something unprecedented took place in a courtroom. Uh, my dad actually was the one to let me know about it. He got his phone out watching the evening news and recorded a video clip uh, because it had made headlines there in their town uh, about a man named Danny Holmes who was standing trial for murder. Um, I actually, I'm going to let Heaven play. I think we have this video clip. I'm going to show it to you real quick and then talk about it. Stunning development in a Middle Tennessee courtroom. A man stood up and pleaded guilty at the start of his first degree murder trial in Murfreesboro. Danny Holmes credited his confession to God and a song from the Christian group Big Daddy Weave called Redeem. He even brought a notebook with the song's lyrics to court and read them aloud. Fort Stellis and Holmes told the court God changed his life more than a year ago and he felt as if God was putting pressure on him to just tell the truth. Holmes is quoted as saying he's been fighting for nothing all his life, but he knew the Lord was telling him to fight for him this time. We heard from Mike Weaver of the group Big Daddy Weed this afternoon. He told us in part, quote, as a band, we have nothing to do with the stories we hear about the song. It's only Jesus, only he can use a song in this way. New at five, restoring confidence. Can we just give the Lord some praise for that? I mean, that's, that's really powerful. There's an article you can find online that talks about for about 20 minutes, Danny Holmes stood right at the beginning of his court trial and said, look, before we do all this, I, I just need to say some things. And he confessed, and as a result, he'll spend a life sentence in prison. But he had determined to choose freedom inside his own soul at whatever the cost. And he spoke to his mom in the courtroom, and he said, Mom, I want you to know I'm so sorry. He apologized to the family of the victim. And he said, I want you to, I'm, I'm going to serve Jesus for the rest of my life. See, choosing freedom is worth whatever it costs. And, and Jesus, just like Mike said in the video, he's the only one that can do something like that. And if you've tasted freedom, if you've, if you've experienced what relationship with King Jesus is like, then you know whatever the cost, it's worth it. And I believe that that's what Danny Holmes realized in his circumstances. Some of you know Mike, the leader of that band and the author of that song, has been one of my best friends for over 20 years. And the, the a most amazing thing about, well, one of the amazing things about that story is that Mike wrote that song, Redeemed, and if you've heard it on the radio, then, you, then, you, then you're familiar with the lyrics. But he wrote that song ministering to his own soul because he has constantly struggled with self-hatred most of his life. And he's being reminded that I cannot partner with the lie when Jesus has redeemed me. I've got to lay hold of the truth. And for God to use Mike's brokenness as he brings it to Jesus to impact someone else to bring their brokenness to Jesus, that just sounds like the kingdom to me. And it sounds like something that we could classify as good news. And that's what the gospel is for sure. If you've got your Bibles with you today, I want you to turn to two passages of Scripture. Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 18. Luke chapter 4 and Matthew 18. We're going to start in Luke 4 and we'll end in Matthew 18. Uh, if I haven't met you yet while you turn there, my name's Nathan Smith. Uh, I'm an executive pastor here at the Refuge and I'm Really honored and privileged to get a chance to share the word of the Lord with you today as we continue really in what's been kind of a, a two-part series called Choosing Freedom that Pastor Jay started last week. Absolutely incredible. And if you didn't hear the message last week, I really encourage you to go back and hear that and meditate on the things that were shared. We're basing these teachings uh, off of a, uh, a series that was done over many weeks. I think it's something like 10 weeks uh, at Gateway Church in, uh, I want to say 2013 is when they did the series called Free Indeed. And so some of the content's coming from there. It's extremely helpful, and I commend that to you as well. Hopefully you found Luke 4. Would you stand with me? I know you've been standing already, but we're going to stand quickly, honor God's Word. And I'm going to read this passage in Luke 4 from verse 16 to 21. It says this, So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. This is speaking of Jesus. And as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
when he opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. I would say that's a great place to have your eyes fixed, just for the record. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's make these declarations together. We make them every week. Are you ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I'm confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give somebody a high five and let's have a seat. Choosing freedom. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says this, it says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Meaning, that's the whole point. He wants us to be free, that's why he's done this. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to, your, to a yoke of slavery. Would that not imply that after being set free, you could go back into bondage? Right? So, the writer says, hey, he set us free. This is the whole point. He wants us to operate in freedom. Therefore, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. And this is what Jesus wants for all of us. And this is something Pastor Jay talked about last week. And so what I want to continue in is talking about choosing freedom. And, and if we're going to understand how we stay and walk in that freedom, we have to understand where of our bondages or strongholds can come from. And I would submit, and this will be my first point, that bondage begins in our brains. Bondage begins in our brains. That was the cutest way I could say that with all the Bs, so I hope you would remember it that way. So thank you for points for that. It's really true that the mind is the battlefield of the spirit on so many levels. And too often, as believers, and if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior today, this definitely applies to you, but I would, I would say this, for those that have put their faith in the Lord, the attack against us is greater because we've taken a stand in an opposing position to what the enemy would want for our lives. And most bondages and strongholds begin as a house of thoughts set up on the inside that we kind of make our way into and dwell. It can sound very much like, I I'm so stupid. I'm clumsy. No one really likes me. People say nice things, but no one really likes me. Because once we agree with those lies, no matter what anyone does, it all goes through that filter, does it not? Someone could hand you a million dollars, and you could say, but they don't mean it, you know? It would be so easy for us to take that filter and take everything through it because of the lie that's been set up in our brain. This is why in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds. Well, then what does he say after that? We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. Do you see a connection with stronghold and destroying arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to do what? To obey Christ. We have got to take captive. Do you know that word in the Greek literally means to hold it at spear point? This is, this is violent stuff, right? This is, we're, this is called spiritual warfare for a reason. It's not spiritual patty cake. It's spiritual warfare because the enemy will oppose you and he will do it in your mind and try to get you to put again a yoke of slavery on your shoulders, on your own shoulders. See, Satan knows he cannot, he cannot defeat a believer, one who is standing in the authority of Christ. So what he will try to do is manipulate your own authority and you can use it against yourself. 
If you've ever, pray, prayerfully not, if you've ever been in a fight before or if you've ever been in a situation to where it was about to, quote unquote, go down, okay? It's, it's important that you know, and if you've not experienced this for me, help me coach you up a little bit. It's important. It doesn't matter if you're strong enough to win or not if you can get the other guy to believe that you are, okay? <laughs> this is just, you're just getting a little street talk, okay? I'm just trying to help, just trying to learn you well. Here, here's the thing. The enemy will try to use our own authority against us. And what is that authority? Well, we have the mind of Christ is what Scripture tells us. But if he can submit something that will cause defeat on the inside, and we just rehearse that thing like it's a record player on skip and repeat, then we will tell, we'll convince ourselves we can't win. So what does the enemy do? Well, he just takes whatever he wants at that point and moseys on down the street because we have allowed our own power and authority to be used against ourselves. So we must take every thought captive. Let's take it at spear point. I mentioned my friend Mike, uh, one, because I love him dearly. He's, he's one of my best friends in the whole world. But Mike recently wrote a book, and, and it's based on the song that you heard about in that opening video that's so powerful. It's called Redeemed, and this is why I share this book with you today. This book is Mike's, it, it's the most raw thing I've ever read. Now, I know Mike, I was with him for many of these stories in the book, but it doesn't matter. He put in print the most raw thing I've ever read of someone saying, I want to invite you into my struggle, and I want to invite you into how I journeyed with the Lord through my struggle, and how the Lord is helping me even today to overcome my struggle. And for him, it's always been self-hatred. Everyone else is amazing. Mike is the nicest guy in the world. He would treat you like, like royalty. But when it comes to himself, he's constantly had the battle of not feeling worthy, not feeling good enough. And he shares some of the stories of that in the book. If you struggle in your mind, I recommend this to you highly. I really think it will bless you. But the point is we've been redeemed and we have the mind of Christ and we can be set free and walk in the freedom that he's given. I'll give you an example of my own struggle. Um, I'm not going super deep right now because I'm just not ready for that, but this is kind of very true. Um, I probably am carrying at least 15 to 20 extra pounds because of something that happened when I was a kid, and the Lord revealed this to me not too long ago. This is a true story. I remember, so first of all, you have to know this about me. I'm not much of a candy guy. Not, don't have a whole lot for candy. Candy bars, thank you very much. Not, cookies, that's fine. When the ice cream man is in the neighborhood, it, it really, I just feel a, a draw. Do you know what I'm saying? I feel like a, 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 a call, you know, to, to go and, and minister. But... And you know, it's funny, I just would always say, well, ice cream's always been my favorite dessert. And I've, I've bared that out throughout my life, you know. But I remember, the Lord brought this to my memory as I was praying. And he said, Nathan, do you remember you were eight or nine years old? And man, it came to me like lightning. I remember where I was. I remember the house we lived in, because we moved a lot as a kid. I remember the evening, and I had asked my parents if I could have some ice cream. And they told me it was too late, it was time for bed. I'm getting ready for bed and I see my mom and dad eating ice cream. You know where this is going. And I can explain this to you, uh, but something set up in my spirit. Now, I gotta, I'm going to back up for a second. So as a kid, one of my favorite TV shows was a show called DuckTales. Anybody remember DuckTales back in the day? Can I get an amen on the DuckTales? Okay, this, this was... This was, right, this was Donald's family. So you got Uncle Scrooge, who's just dirty rich. I mean, he's just filthy rich. And that's important because in the opening sequence of the show, he dives into a, just a sea of gold coins. Can I get, right, you've seen this, okay? And he's just swimming through the gold coins, and it's supposed to illustrate how wealthy he is in the show. I instantly heard a voice in my ear at eight or nine years old. And this is part humorous and part very potent. And it said this, when I grow up, no one's ever going to tell me that I can't have ice cream at any time of day, at any point in my life. 
I dare you, okay? And then I saw a picture of myself. This is a little kid, right? The Lord brought this back to my memory. I saw a picture of myself swimming, right? I jumped <laughs> off the diving board, right, into the pool of ice cream. And it was just bliss. Like, it was really just a, a holy moment for me. Here's the problem. Doesn't that sound harmless? Doesn't that sound sweet? Doesn't that sound like, well, it's just a kid who likes ice cream and he's frustrated that his parents get some and he doesn't. But did you know something? That led to some unhealthy practices in my life. And I surrendered my guard in some areas all because of a thought that I held on to. I'm talking about points where I just could not say no anymore. And I wanted to. Hello? Because when a thought is presented and the enemy comes along and says, let me be your comforter. We're not going to let anybody treat us like that. Me, me and you, we're, we're going to take care of this. And one day, see, I believe that a lot of us have heard that voice. And obviously, I shared a, 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 a tongue-in-cheek version, but it's a real thing in my life, especially now that I'm going to the gym a little more trying to fight against uh, the all the ice cream, right? There's a battle there. The spiritual warfare it continues. But I do believe that if we're not careful, we allow the enemy to use our own authority against us. That's why James 4 says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But what must happen first? Submit yourself to God, not to some attitude, not to some reoccurring script in our minds of how it's going to be when I'm in charge. Submit ourselves to the Lord. Because see, some of us are trying to resist the devil, and he ain't fleeing. And so, you know what we're doing? We're getting discouraged. And we're saying, well, it doesn't work for me. Maybe it works for Pastor Jay. That's great. Maybe it works for Pastor Terry. It just doesn't work for me. Because I'm over here resisting, and it's hard, and I'm not winning. Yeah, we got to submit to the Lord first and his kingship and say, God, would you root out every agreement, every thought, anything inside of me that I've come into agreement with that has no basis in truth? Anywhere I've allowed the enemy to use my authority against me, would you show it to me, Lord? Would you cancel it? Because then when it says this, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Let me tell you something, that is good news today. So it begins in our brain. Second point is this, now that we've established that, Let's go back where we started. Jesus came to set us free. This is a good place for an amen. He did. Jesus came to set us free. Now, it's not his entire job description because he came to establish the kingdom. He came to restore everything that was broken. He came to bring in the goodness of the Lord where we've ruined everything. And as a part of that package deal, he came to set us free. Let's look at what he read because he's quoting Isaiah 61. This passage in Luke we read this. It says that he turned in the scroll to the passage in Isaiah, and he read this. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. To proclaim liberty to the captives, even those enslaved to ice cream. Praise God. And recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus says, Hey, all of this that we just read in the, in the Old Testament prophet, it's all fulfilled in me. I'm here. Here's my business card. Just letting you know. So the good news today is if you found yourself in bondage in your brain or agreeing with some lies, Jesus has come to set us free. That is good news. And he has all authority to do it. He has all authority to do it. Let me just break down. This, this gives us a picture of five of the foundational ministries of Jesus. Of course, there's more that he does, but here's five foundational things. We'll give them to you quickly. Salvation. What does he say? To proclaim good news to the poor, the year of the Lord's favor. Two, spirit baptism. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've been anointed for this. Three, healing. Recovery of sight to the blind. This is what he does. Four, deliverance. To proclaim freedom to the prisoners. Praise God. Number five, emotional healing, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the oppressed 
free. Do you know the Greek word there used for broken hearted literally means shattered into pieces. Doesn't just mean had a bad day. Doesn't just mean it was tough, but just pull it together. It means shattered to pieces. And the good news is Jesus came to heal that. Hallelujah. It's a good thing that Jesus lets us know, not only have I come to do this, I have all the authority to do it, and I'm making it available to you right now. Not only was he making it available in Luke 4, he's making it available to us right here on this Sunday morning. Because when a, when a broken heart takes place, and we've all been there, every single person in this room, on some level, at some, and it's not important that we try to compare whose story is, that, that's not even important. It's the fact that your heart was broken. Here's the beautiful thing about our God. He loves us enough to heal us, but he exposes it. Let me give you just a couple of examples of a spiritual oppression that will try to set up camp in a broken heart because we need our hearts healed. I'm getting ahead of myself, but remember, Jesus said one of the names of Satan is the Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub the Lord of the flies. See, flies are attracted to an open wound. And anytime there's a broken heart, guess where the enemy tries to rush in? And that's where we start making agreements. I'll never let anybody. Right? You will never talk to me that way. You'll never see your grandchildren again. Because what happens is we are devastated. And the Lord of the flies says, this looks like a good place to lay some eggs. Because that's what flies do. Let me show you seven quick things. This gets really good in just a moment, so hang with me, okay? I know it's heavy, but it's gotta, we got to know the bad news so we can celebrate the good news, right? With a broken heart, a spirit of rejection can set in. And where there's a spirit of rejection, strongholds are very easily established. One can be anger. Now, I'm not talking about you got mad because the Panthers lost last week. I'm not talking about that, okay? And we are mad, 49ers fans. I'm just letting you know, okay? But so there's anger. But I'm not talking about you're upset about something. I'm talking about a spirit of anger. And those of you that have ever contended with this know exactly what I'm talking about. We're talking about incredible Hulk, spirit of rage, uncontrollable, you couldn't stop me if you wanted to. And this happens a lot, especially if you grew up as a scrapper and you fought a lot. Where that comes from, see, we poke it a lot. We got MMA fights and whatever else. People with a spirit of anger, we just like to probably say, go out there, we'll pay you money to do that got to be very, very careful. There is a spirit that will come in and say, I will defend your broken heart. We'll never let anyone do that to us again. Spirit of anger. Second thing, deep insecurity. Again, I'm not talking about a little shy with something. I'm talking about deep insecurity. Super hyper defensive, constantly looking to be accepted by anybody at any time for any reason. That's Usually a stronghold that comes from a broken heart somewhere. Three, pride. No one's ever going to break my heart again. So pride comes in. Four, independence. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. So you can offer all the advice you want. does not matter. I'm, I'm doing me, and you can't tell me anything. That's a spirit of rejection that has set up, and it usually, not always, usually comes from a broken heart. Number five, easily offended. Everybody's picking on me. Again, we're not talking about had a tough day or a difficult week. I'm talking about a pattern. We see a spiritual stronghold, excessive shyness and loneliness. Not, I'm not a people person. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about imprisoned inside of yourself. Right? Th- that is a bondage. That is a stronghold. Okay? 
and it typically comes from a broken heart. Seven, a controlling or manipulative spirit. A controlling spirit cannot be confronted. Can't. Because as soon as you try to confront it, it's like, oh, yeah, well, what about you? And you're always this. And you, you know, as a matter of fact, you always. And it cannot be confronted because there's such a wound. And none of these things are being listed to try to pick on anybody. I just want to bring, I want to tell on the enemy for a minute and say, hey, if you find yourself in some of these places, there's some really good news. See point number two, Jesus came to set us free, okay? That's why we have to talk about it. See, we try to learn how to manage our strongholds. But Jesus didn't come so that you could cope with your stronghold. Jesus didn't spill his blood so that you could kind of navigate the difficult. He came to set us free. And we have to be able to accept that we need it. And oftentimes we've lived with something so long we no longer feel the weight of our chains. But can I tell you something? Just because you no longer feel the weight of your chains does not mean that you're free. Sometimes that's the worst kind of bondage. The kind we think that's not there. Because we've just got accustomed to it. Well, my mom is always this way, so it's just the way it's going to be. My daddy always, and so I, this is just how we are, right? Well, maybe that's true. Thank God Jesus came to set us free, you know, and give us a restored vision and life and to heal our broken hearts. Part of that healing often comes through people. That's why number three is this, we need people in our lives. If we're going to choose freedom, we've got to remember that it's a, often a battle in our minds, that Jesus is the one that can set us free, and that we need people in our lives in this process. Some of you know this, and I haven't said a lot, but uh, three weeks ago, today and into t tonight, uh, my mom, Shirley Smith, 61 years old, beautiful, uh, went to be with Jesus, and... Um, it was really hard, and it's still really hard. And I tell you this, and it may seem strange, but every day since, at some point in my day, as I'm missing my mom, I would see an image, and this, it's not gruesome, but it sounds disturbing. I would see an image of me cutting my finger off, randomly walking through Publix or whatever. I would just see an image of me cutting my finger off. I have no desire to cut my finger off, just to make sure I'm clear on this. As a musician, it's really not to my advantage, okay? And I'm like, what is this? And I began to ask some people, and, and the Lord began to minister to my heart and say, Nathan, in the midst of your grief, you may be tempted to separate yourself from the body, but don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Because you see, once you separate from the body, then you lose all the benefit of the kidneys that purifies that broken limb and the liver that will purify that limb and the brain that will rebuild the synapses and the nerves and all the things that I don't understand. But we have to be connected to the body for all those benefits to be there. But the truth is when we've got a broken heart or we've been wounded, we want to get away. And it's human nature, so no one's in trouble today. But I'm telling you, I love Jesus. I'm a people person. I love being around people. And the Lord warned me. He said, Nathan, there's going to come a time where you're going to be tempted to want to separate from the body. Don't do it. In our hurt, it can be tempting. And can I tell you something? Thursday, I hit the zenith of my grief at this stage. And uh, I was preparing for this message, and I'm just being honest, I just felt like in a million years, I cannot do this. And I, I was at the house of prayer in downtown Concord, and I laid on my face, and I just cried out to the Lord. And I said, Jesus, you've got to help me. I don't know how long I prayed that, but my phone rang. And it was my buddy, Mike. And he's in Nevada or somewhere on tour. He's got a crazy schedule. And I barely could answer the phone. I just put it on speakerphone. 
and the gnarliest sound you've ever heard in your life when someone's trying to answer the phone took place. <laughs> you know, I'm just, it, was, it, was, it was really bad. And Mike didn't miss a beat. He just began to pray over me. And for the next 30 minutes, I laid on my face and my friend prayed for me. Jesus answered my prayer and he sent a person. Some of us, the answer to your prayer has been trying to get to you for a long time. But you are not interested because we've been hurt and we want to separate from people. Listen, there's a dozen people, and I don't mean this bad, that could have called me and I wouldn't have taken the call at that moment. Can I just be honest? But a friend? Our culture is sick. We're not good at being together anymore. But can I tell you something? The gospel requires that we do this together. Henry Cloud said this in his book, Changes That Heal. Denial of one's need for others is the most common type of defense against bonding. If people come from a situation where they're growing up or later in life where good, safe relationships were not available to them, they learn to deny that they even want them. Why want what you can't have? They slowly get rid of the awareness of the need. All of us have been through different things. All of us have been hurt by people. I have been hurt by many people. I've been hurt, well, I've been hurt by many people. But I'm more impressed with the Lord who can heal me than I am with the people that have hurt me. And I want to challenge you today to fix your eyes. Sometimes we don't want to connect with other people because we're afraid they'll confront us. Because sometimes the way we find out about our bondages and strongholds is we're in relationship with people. And they may say, man, that, you got kind of lit up really fast on that one issue. We don't want to hear that because that hurts. But the problem is hurt and harm are not the same thing. Henry Cloud goes on to say this, there's a big difference between hurt and harm. We all hurt sometimes in facing hard truths, but it makes us grow. It can be the source of huge growth. That is not harmful. Harm is when you damage someone. Facing reality is usually not a damaging experience, even though it can hurt. Navigating things that we've been through and facing the reality can be hurtful. But it's not harmful for us to face them because then we can hand them to Jesus. I cannot give anybody this bottle of water until I pick it up and then say, here. If we avoid the pain and the hurt indefinitely, then it will indefinitely be there. But until we say, man, that was a hard thing. I wish I'd never experienced that. God, I'm so sorry, but I would like to give it to thee. He is faithful and just and will not only take it in its place he will give you his grace his mercy and his freedom james 5 16 says this therefore confess your sins to each other pray for each other so that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective most people only quote the last part of that verse you ever notice that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective how many times have you heard that how about the whole verse how did that righteous person get righteous? Tell people the stuff that you're not proud of. Like, tell them. Confess your sins one to another. Why? So you can have a cry fest? So that you can be healed. This is the whole point. My confession to the Lord, only he can do what he can do. But there is a measure of healing that comes when my brother knows my struggle and gets in it with me and says, hey man, I love you. We're going to fight this thing together. And so I want to challenge and encourage you. Part of our healing, part of our freedom is going to come through other people. And the last piece is this. Number four, unforgiveness blocks God's grace. When Jesus gave his business card and said, this is what I've come to do. He said, and I will heal the brokenhearted. I'll bind up those who are oppressed. I'll set them free. 
That word for oppressed can also be translated as bruised. And a bruise is an internal wound. It's, it's bleeding on the inside. It doesn't necessarily look gruesome on the outside, but it's sensitive. And the truth is, because we've been wounded, it's easy for us to harbor unforgiveness. But if you've ever had a bruise that just wouldn't seem to go away, it doesn't matter what you do, it seems like everybody and everything has a heat seeker on that one spot on your body that somehow they'll like contort and bump into you right in that spot where you have that bruise, and that's when you find out how much salvation you still have in that moment, you know, because you want to Judy chop somebody, you know. So a bruise really can be related to you easily, to unforgiveness because by not addressing it, it just stays there and it becomes very harmful. I told you we'd be in two passages. We're about to finish up in Matthew 18. If you've got it, you can flip over there. I'm going to paraphrase the first portion of this parable, 18, 21 through 31. But this is where uh, the disciples come to Jesus and say, how many times should I forgive my brother? Jesus says 70 times 7. And then he begins to tell a story. He says, the kingdom of heaven... Uh, is like a king who forgave one person a debt. Who he, This person owed 10,000 bags of gold, and because he begged and pleaded, the king said, you know what, I forgive the debt. 10,000 bags of gold. Well, then in that same story, the forgiven man finds someone that owes him 100 silver coins. Now, I don't have the converter for us today, but 100, what do we say, 100, no, 10,000 bags of gold and 100 silver coins we can just go ahead and deduce ginormous difference, okay? So he finds a person that owes him a hundred silver coins, and the person begs for mercy, and he says, nope, and he has him locked in prison until he can pay the debt. So let's pick up in verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. This is the one he had forgiven the debt. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Watch very carefully verse 35. This is Jesus speaking a parable. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Make sure you read it in your Bible. Don't just trust my notes on the screen, okay? This is what Jesus said. Matter of fact, he says it a lot. In Matthew 6, Sermon on the Mount, he says, unless you forgive others, my Father will not forgive you. This is what Jesus said. But we feel entitled to our pain because our heart got broken. That's why we need Jesus to mend and heal our hearts, which is what he came to do, hallelujah, so that with a whole heart, I can release everybody else that's ever harmed me in any way. That doesn't mean we might be best friends and go to movies together. But it does mean I can cancel the debt. Why? Because so much debt was canceled for me. Jesus said, let me show you something. I want you to understand the way my father works. He's a merciful, merciful God. But if you do not act in kind, the same measure of judgment you extend will be measured against you. I don't want that. So Lord, heal my heart so that I can cancel all the debts, so that I can live in freedom and be who you've called me to be in total. Second Corinthians Chapter 2 says this, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. What does Satan want to do? Use our authority against ourselves to get us trapped in a bondage for freedom he set us free. Don't go back and put a, a yoke of slavery on again because you can't. Why would he write it unless it was possible to do? So Jesus reminds us we've got to set people free in forgiveness. And as we do, 
we invite the Holy Spirit to send an eviction notice to every bondage, stronghold, evil spirit that would want to plague us so that we can dwell in the freedom that only Jesus has the authority to bring. I'm going to close with this story and give you an opportunity to respond. In 2007, I went on a men's retreat. Five days on a ranch in Texas, just me and Jesus and a bunch of people I didn't know, and I was really happy about that. To just not be anybody other than I'm Nathan from North Carolina. When I got there, there was an older man that uh, arrived to be a part of this trip, and from the moment he got out of his truck, and he had sat in his truck for a while, but from the moment he got out of the truck, there was such anger and hatred on his face. So much so that I generally try to say, hey, to whoever I can, I just kind of was like, you know, I'm going to let my man have a little space, you know? And I, I stood to the other side, and that's pretty much how it went for the next few days. Didn't say a lot. It was very quiet. You could see the hatred in his face. Over the days, the Lord was just ministering to him. You wouldn't know that from looking at him, but obviously, based on the testimony, we, we saw God do a great work. At one point, there was an opportunity to just come to the middle of the room, sit in a chair, and release forgiveness. And at one point, that older man, I don't even know his name, it's been a long time, he had to be in his 70s, he was the oldest person there in our group. He sat in the chair, and he began to tell the story of how he looked up to his older brother his whole life, he was his hero. And he grew up on a farm up north. And one day his older brother brought him into the barn and sexually assaulted him there. And he never told anybody that his entire life. But it, it produced such a hurt, he had a shattered heart. And anger came in. Because the enemy said, we will never let this happen to us again. So he burned the barn down. When he burned the barn down, his family lost everything. And they lived in abject poverty for the rest of their days because nothing was insured. He knew all those years that he was the reason that his family suffered and the enemy tormented him about it night and day. And a 70-something-year-old man sat in that chair and bawled like a baby. he began to release forgiveness to his older brother, who had been dead many years. And he began to ask forgiveness of his parents, who had been dead many years, for burning the barn down and never telling them. And as he began to release it, I'm telling you, Jesus himself, the presence of God, came into that place. And there was a, it's almost like what's happening right now, there was a sweet presence of the Lord that came in. Then something happened I'll never forget till the day I see Jesus face to face. He shot up out of that chair, tears in his eyes, and he ran out the back door. And he ran down the hill because there was a giant river at the base of the house. And you can think what you want about this, but he just began to take everything off. This is February. And he dives into that water and for the next 20 minutes splashes and plays was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. From that moment forward, you could not pray for anybody without him being right beside you, laying hands on them, praying for them. From that moment forward, if he hugged you, you just had to pray. You got a good breath before he got there because you weren't going to be breathing for a little while because he would squeeze the life out of you. Why? It was the same day because when King Jesus comes, and we let him in, and we let go of all the stuff that's burdening us so bad. He sets us free. And when you're free, you act free. Second service today, we're going to be opening up the baptism tank for some people that have 
made professions of faith, and they're going to be baptized at the end of our second service. But maybe today for you, maybe you're like, I want to get in the water. I want to get in the water. I want to get in the river. Well, then stick around. Or come back at about 12, 15. And there's a table in the back, and we can help you get started. If you've not been baptized, if you've not given your life to Jesus, you can do it today. But here's what I want to do, and I've gone two minutes over, and I do apologize for that. But as I've been talking, at any point, if the Lord began to bring memories to your mind that you know you just need to give something to Jesus, I'm not going to qualify it any further than that. But memories, it could be as simple as my little ice cream thought that I had, but it led to a stronghold. It could be as deep as something I shared just now, but you know, not because Nathan said something, the Holy Spirit spoke to you. Would you just stand? Just a memory came and you need to give it to Jesus. I'm not gonna ask you to say anything out loud, but you're like, it just came. And you saw it. And the fact that you saw it was a confirmation. I need to give this to Jesus. I'm not saying you have to feel good at giving it to Jesus or knowing exactly how. That's okay, we're gonna do this together. But you know, as sure as anything, right now you're like, I, I know for a fact this memory came to my mind because I need to give it to Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing. His arms, I mean, his shoulders are almost coming out of the socket because it's his arms are stretched so wide because he's so excited to embrace whatever you would dare to give him today. I'm just going to wait just another moment. There's a memory, there's a thought that came. You're like, I need to give this to the Lord. Oh, Nathan, I gave this to it a long time ago. Well, if it came to your mind now, then let's just give it to him again. Came to your mind. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to give you the opportunity to repeat something after me, and that is 100% your choice. Everyone else is going to close their eyes. It's really none of our business. But I want you to know something. All of heaven is on the edge of their seat. Pleading so that the freed ones would not go back to bondage. And that we would let some things go into the arms of Jesus. So King Jesus, you are most welcome here, great God. And today we lift up your great name. And I thank you that you're for us and not against us. God, I thank you today that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So Lord, right now I pray for each of these that are standing and those that don't have the courage right now to stand and I do not fault them. There is grace on them today. But for those that are standing and those that should be standing, that Lord, there was something that was quickened in their heart, a memory, an action, Maybe it's something they did. Maybe it's something someone else did. But Lord, it has set up a stronghold or there's an oppression. Or if anything, we just know there's some unforgiveness that has got to be dealt with. Lord, I pray for the grace of God for them to be more impressed with you than they are with that brokenness. More impressed with your ability to bring us into freedom than they are in quote unquote, letting someone off the hook. We're just giving them to you, Jesus. So Lord, I pray that you would do that. So I'm gonna pray this prayer. If you're standing, I invite you to pray after me. It's up to you. But if you choose to pray it, the authority is in praying it out loud because life and death is in the power of our tongue. So I invite you to say this, Father, I submit these memories to you. I ask you to heal me now from all the stress, from all the pain, all the bitterness, and all the unforgiveness. I choose now by an act of my will to forgive and to be healed in Jesus' holy name. 